Good evening, and welcome to the CSIS TCU Schieffer School of Journalism series. Um, we're pleased that uh, you all could be with us tonight. I'm Andrew Schwartz, Vice President of External Relations here at CSIS. Um, after uh, Bob and the panel kicks it around a bit, we'll be able to take some of your questions, and if you could come up to the mic and um, ask your questions, that'll be great. But with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bob Schieffer, and I'd also like to say uh, thank you to TCU for being here and being part of this and, and this wonderful series that we're able to do with Bob. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks all of you for coming. So we have uh, today basically a journalist roundtable on Afghanistan uh, and Pakistan, and we hope to talk uh, about that. And we have uh, four people here who know a lot about this and uh, who know about it from being there on the scene and getting ready to go back. Rajiv uh, Chandrasekhar, uh, associate editor of the Washington Post, been with us before. He wrote the uh, great book on uh, on Iraq uh, life uh, in the Imperials in the Emerald City, uh, life inside the Green Zone. It's still one of the best books, I think, about Iraq, and has done a lot of groundbreaking reporting. You're getting ready to go to Afghanistan now next week? Yep. Next week. Nancy Youssef, uh, who was the uh, Baghdad Bureau Chief for the McClatchy newspapers for about four years. She's been writing about Iraq for even longer than that. Got back from uh, Afghanistan uh, in January, and she's getting ready to go back in about a week or so. That's right. Ed uh, Luce uh, was uh, Washington Bureau, made Washington Bureau Chief of the Financial Times in uh, June of 2006. Writes about the U.S. economy, politics, foreign policy. Uh, manages a team of Washington Post reporters from 2001 to 2006. He was the South Asia Bureau Chief uh, for the Financial Times based in New Delhi. Began his career as a Geneva-based correspondent uh, for The Guardian. Uh, of the United detail. Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, he has highly acclaimed book, India in Spite of the Gods, The Strange Rise of Modern India, uh, came out in 2008. And of course, over on the right, my old buddy, David Sanger, who's the Chief Washington Correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, his new book is just out. It is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and it is called The Inheritance, The World Obama confronts and the challenges to American power. It's sort of a, I call it a owner's manual for uh, the new president coming into office and kind of a guide on the, uh, the problems. I think he knows what they are now, David. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure he enjoyed having your book uh, to give him a little start on it. Uh, we want to talk about uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and I think uh, the interesting thing about this is where these were being dealt with as sort of two separate subjects in the previous administration. Uh, the Obama administration has basically put uh, uh, the two countries together. And uh, I want to talk about uh, is that a good idea? What does that mean? Uh, and why don't we just start with you, David. Uh, bring us up to date on where we are right now in these two countries, and do you see these uh, two policies that are being put together as sort of one policy now? Well, they said quite explicitly, Bob, that uh, that was going to be the intent of the new administration when they came in, although I think in all fairness to um, President Bush and his team, they were beginning to do that in the last policy reviews that took place uh, at the end of last year as they began to recognize that, of course, since the problem was a common one and since the insurgents um, don't particularly uh, view the border that we all care about as a border for them, uh, that these were two completely interrelated problems and completely interrelated insurgencies. Of course, there's a long history of having a lot of difficulty getting uh, the governments of Pakistan and Afghanistan to work together themselves. And there were a number of cases uh, during the Bush administration, there have been some in the Obama administration, where efforts to try to coordinate military operations, and even diplomatic operations, but military for sure, so that you could squeeze the insurgents on both sides of the border, have by and large not worked, because the Pakistanis weren't moving up to that border and because the Afghans were in many cases uh, not capable and, and U.S. forces, of course, have been stretched thin. I think the interesting thing about the uh, Obama policy since they turned it out about uh, two, two and a half months ago is this, that if you read what its core objective is, it is to defeat al-Qaeda and its associates. 
It says nothing about democratizing uh, Afghanistan. Uh, most of the political objectives that President Bush had laid out have been set aside, other than chasing after uh, and defeating uh, Al Qaeda and, and its associates. The difficulty that they've run into, of course, is that while we are pouring troops into uh, Afghanistan, we'll have about 60,000, I guess, by the end of the summer, by the time this is done, maybe even a bit more if you include some of the, the support troops. Al Qaeda, of course, is largely in Pakistan, and we can't operate there. And so even if you deal with it as a single entity, as a matter of policy, as a matter of practice, uh, except to the degree that they are pursuing the uh, covert programs that, that President Bush uh, extended last summer uh, when he authorized both um, a broader predator strikes and a, a bigger target group, or some of the operations that President Obama has done since, by and large, we have our hands tied still in Pakistan. I want to ask Rajiv and Nancy both the same question. You're getting ready to go back to Afghanistan. Uh, what are you going to be working on? What are the stories you're going to be looking, on, uh, looking for as you go back? You just want me to tip my hand right here? <laughs> um, uh, I want to just follow up on, on, on one thing David was saying. Uh, while the, the administration's stated uh, strategic objective is, as, as David noted, uh, going after Al Qaeda. That they have certainly de-emphasized the broader talk of democracy building, uh, other sort of broader reconstruction efforts. Um, much of the the, the U.S. Um, activity on the ground, both on the civilian and military side, is largely unchanged today from the way from what was going on a year or two, three ago. In fact, in, in many ways, there's, there's simply an increase. There are more troops flowing in, particularly into the South. Uh, there are more reconstruction dollars that will be flowing through the pipeline. Um, and what I want to develop a better understanding of is where does this effort, as it plays out on the ground, link up with this broader sort of strategic change that has been articulated from the White House? Um, and how do, how do you get to a point where your focus is simply going after Al Qaeda and denying them sanctuary? And what appears to be the case is that um, the the administration, and principally through uh, the Special Envoy Ambassador Holbrook, uh, as well as General Petraeus and their respective staffs, uh, believe that you need a, de a continued degree of engagement uh, in Afghanistan on the Reconstruction Front, both in terms of at the local level building up uh, local governance and local institutions, uh, the, the police force, or the Afghan army, um, as well as uh, other types of more traditional uh, reconstruction efforts, particularly with regard to, to agriculture, for instance, as they seek to try to, to uh, find new ways to, to combat some of the poppy cultivation, particularly in the South. But, but understanding how uh, uh, the, the, the new strategic objectives and the, the very vague uh, white paper that was released by the administration now some weeks ago translates into changes on the ground is something that, that will be sort of um, you know, up there on my list. And then also trying to, 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 to see how, this, uh, ad how the addition of, of U.S. forces in the South plays out. Uh, the U.S. Marines and a striker brigade are just starting to flow in to southern Afghanistan. They won't really be operational for another uh, four weeks or so. Uh, they're waiting for a lot of their equipment to, to, to follow them. Um, but, but what does that mean? All of a sudden, the South, which had been principally the domain of the British and the Canadians with, with a few uh, Dutch and Australian and some Americans thrown in, now uh, will be a principally American uh, theater. Um, and uh, the Americans are going to push into parts of Helmand province and, and parts of Kandahar province. Um, and, and, and how will that um, uh, uh, change the dynamics down there? Uh, there's going to be a political component to it too, Bob, as uh, U.S. casualties rise. Uh, how will that affect uh, support for Obama's broader AFPAC efforts back home? Nancy. Well, I'm looking at this as a Pentagon correspondent. And so one of the things that I'm focused on and, and folks uh, looked at when I was there in January is the military's transition from Iraq to Afghanistan. Because up until this point, the mindset, the, the equipment, the training was all focused towards Iraq. And you're seeing a military that's trying to very rapidly adjust to Afghanistan and finding that 
the lessons learned in Iraq, which in some cases took years to get to, doesn't translate into, into Afghanistan as well, and you're starting to see the readjustment. The, the, the armor that they wear in, in, in Iraq doesn't apply to Afghanistan. It's too heavy. The, the MRAPs that we talk about so much, the vehicles that were designed to protect um, troops against the IED threat in Iraq, again, doesn't work against the rough terrain in Afghanistan. And so from my perspective, the, my job is constantly to, to cover that, that transition um, from one war zone to the next. And as um, Rajiv mentioned, the, the, the paper that the administration put out is quite broad. And so when you're on the ground, you end up seeing the responsibility of sort of translating that into a practical policy, falling on 22-year-old second lieutenants in the Marines and how they go about doing that. The other thing as a military correspondent that I'm looking at is that what they do with the numbers. You know, in Iraq, they had 140,000 troops, upwards of 150,000 on a surge to send in, to really flood Baghdad and put, out, put troops out in every little community to, to, to deal with the threat. Whereas in Afghanistan, as we've mentioned, it's about 60,000, 100,000 if you start to count the co coalition troops. Um, and so how do you use those troops effectively? Um, will, will we find them in outposts? Will they be able to reach the tribal leaders? Or will we see them um, instead um, try, being a quick reaction force, if you will, and reaching out to the local tribal leaders and the local security chiefs and saying, look, if you work with the Taliban, we'll be here to back you if they, if they come and attack you. So, um, how they how they dole those troops out, how they move in the south, and thirdly, the relationship between the coalition and the U.S. forces. Again, we'll have a larger U.S. presence, so what was um, something that could really be called a coalition effort will become a U.S. effort. And the problem becomes how the Canadians do something is different than how the British do it, than how the Dutch do it, than how the Germans do it. And so, how do you how do you meld those efforts together, particularly in a, in a region as complex as, as the south? Uh, Edward Luce, let me talk to you about Pakistan, because I think uh, the administration has concluded that the central problem is Pakistan. Uh, how much influence uh, can we exert over Pakistan? How much influence are we exerting now, and what is the main problem there? The, the main, well, uh, stabilizing democracy, getting clear institutions that, that, that survive and that can uh, you know, have some degree of integrity, mm -hmm. a government that functions across the whole of the territorial um, uh, expanse we call Pakistan. Um, uh, I was reading um, back over something the other day, and I was talking to Rajiv about this as well. Uh, when Carter, President Carter, um, gave a billion dollars to General Zia in 1980 following the Soviet invasion um, of Afghanistan, Zia said, this is peanuts, which is obviously a uh, a very pointed insult to the president. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, now, we're now looking at 29 years later, um, a much ballyhooed, fanfared, Kerry Luger bill, supported strongly by the administration, which will increase civilian and economic aid to 1.5 billion a year, admittedly from much, much lower levels. It's a tripling. Um, but uh, uh, you know, if it was peanuts, then and look at the rate of inflation, we'd have to have some sub peanut category of, uh, to describe this. This has got this is a $300 billion economy, it's got 175 million people. Um, and uh, whilst it's absolutely right for the Obama administration to focus much, much more strongly on how it can deal with the civilian side of Pakistan and governance strengthening and institution building and all the other kinds of things that come with this bill. Um, I think that the conditions that are being attached to it and the benchmarks that Kerry Luger are going to require of the administration um, uh, for um, how this spending is accounted for uh, make it look, makes it look really ambitious. I mean, we've got all sorts of things covered by this bill. We've got women's health. We've got education. We've got democracy strengthening, quite apart from the separate um, benchmarks of reorienting the Pakistan army to the to the Fatah regions away from the border with India. We've got microcredit. Um, we've got every good thing under the sun. Um, and uh, uh, my fear is that this is um, not just too little, but it's also too ambitious, but paradoxically. Um, so what do we do about Pakistan? Well, this is a start, but it's a very, very small start. Um, it's very easy as a journalist to sit here and be glib and say you should do this, that, and the other. I really can't think what this, that, and the other would be with Pakistan. It's a very, very difficult situation. I do know that Holbrook was privately remarked 
uh, that somebody reported uh, that it needs $50 billion. Uh, that kind of money um, would, would help transform um, some sectors in Pakistan if the government was capable of absorbing it and had a plan to do something with it. But uh, I'm sorry not to give a clearer answer. It's, it's a very, very difficult situation. And there are, there are no easy solutions. But let, let me just ask uh, uh, David, because you've written about this. I mean, one of the problems, obviously, are the nuclear weapons, and are they secure? If I understood President Obama or somebody in the administration the other day, they said they did feel that as of now, uh, we, we believe that these weapons are secure. But then didn't I also hear uh, Leon Panetta say the other day, we don't know where all of them are. That, that's right. So um, how can we be sure that they're secure if we don't know where some of them are? You know, these are the kinds of questions that it's, it's always fun to ask government officials because you're always sort of waiting for a creative answer. Uh, and um, uh, in fact, you have had regular assurances from uh, government, assur uh, government officials both during the Bush administration and now during the Obama administration. Admiral Mullen has repeated these uh, uh, in recent times, of uh, a relative sense of security about the weapons themselves. Uh, the U.S. had a program, which we've written about uh, extensively, that started um, fairly early after, in the years after 9-11, that spent about $100 million to help train the Pakistanis to uh, protect their weapons <laughs> train them on how we protect some of our facilities. Uh, when I was in Pakistan working on the book, they described to me how they have built their own uh, equivalent of our PAL system, the, the, uh, the uh, computerized links that try to make sure that you can't detonate uh, a weapon if one goes missing. Um, most people I talked to seem fairly, well com fairly confident that the weapons themselves are protected and the warheads are separated. Uh, from the fissile material and the triggering devices and so forth. Uh, the difficulty, the thing that I hear a lot of nervousness about uh, comes in two areas, Bob. One of them is um, that we're still very concerned about the materials. Pakistan is building, adding on to its nuclear arsenal probably faster than just about any country on Earth right now. And a lot of people believe that some of that military aid that we sent uh, over the years may have well either been funneled off to that or at least freed up Pakistani money for that. And it's the materials uh, which are worked on in the laboratories that were, of course, the leakage point for AQ Khan, the, the, uh, one of the founders of the Pakistani program. The other is a considerable insider threat. There's been a ready streams of in intelligence suggesting that uh, some people, some Pakistanis were trained abroad uh, are subject to some recruitment, uh, so they would come back and work inside the Pakistani nuclear program. Uh, the Pakistanis told me when I was there, there are about 2,000 engineers who have what they call critical knowledge about how to build a weapon. I think there's a lot of concern about uh, insiders with, uh, with fundamentalist tendencies. Um, so those are the two big issues. And as uh, Director Panetta said the other day, uh, we don't know where everything is, and that's in part because while the Pakistanis don't, of course, trust the Indians, they're fearful of al-Qaeda and the Taliban, well, they really don't trust us. And they think that we always have a SEAL team hanging just off the horizon ready to snatch their weapons. And that may not be an entirely fanciful concern. Uh, so uh, I think there's, it is really the area where you see the cost of this lack of trust. Do you want to add to that, uh, Edward, um, because I know you're so familiar with Pakistan. Uh, About the nuclear security yes. of the nuclear weapons. Yes. Well, there's, I mean, I've recently reviewed David's book, and he knows a hundred times more about that subject mm -hmm. than me. Um, all, all I'd say is that, um, I, as you'll probably attest, that most of the designs, in terms of leaking of knowledge, most of the designs for these weapons you know, are on the Internet, and they're 1945 sort of quality nuclear weapons. Um, and... Um, the security um, of the Kahuta um, uh, eco nuclear ecosystem is, I think, it's been, it, it, the vulnerability of it has been slightly exaggerated um, in, by rec in, in recent media reports around the world. You know, it's, it, it, the, it, Bunur and Swat might be 60 miles away from, from Islamabad, but uh, there's a very, very strong Punjabi ar army in, in Punjabistan, if you like, um, and it, it, it's, I think probably not quite as vulnerable as some of the media reports have been 
have, have been suggesting. Rajiv and uh, Nancy, let me ask you about Afghanistan. How bad is this situation now? I mean, is it any better than it was? Is it getting worse? Uh, does anything, we've just had a change in commanders. Uh, just talk about those subjects in general as you, you head over there. What do you, uh, what do you think about this situation? Well, I still think the, the, the metrics are pretty bad uh, when it comes to uh, overall security. I mean, um, in, in much of the south and the east of the country, um, the, the Taliban uh, have de facto control of much of that territory. Um, uh, they, they, they sort of own the night. They, uh, they effectively have, have cowed uh, villagers into uh, supporting them both through outright intimidation as well as stepping into a void um, that, that exists there because there, there, is, there is in most places, or at least in many places, a lack of effective local policing, a, fact of, a, a lack of effective local governance. And so the Taliban sort of step in as, as the local administrative force. I, I was out um, just about two months ago um, uh, to the northwest uh, of, of Kandahar in a district called Maywand where there is a U.S. Army battalion um, and was, was talking to some of the soldiers there and they were, they were telling me how just a few days earlier um, a, a man had approached the, uh, the municipal center where there is a company of U.S. soldiers uh, that, were me that are mentoring the, the Afghan po police force in that district and the man came up and, uh, and, and tried to get the attention of the Afghan police because his motorcycle had been stolen um, and the police couldn't be bothered. Uh, they eventually sort of said to him that he'd have to pay a bribe if they wanted the police to, to get involved. And so finally, in a huff, the man said, well, I'm going to the Taliban because at least they'll take me seriously. It's, it's this sort of, um, of real lack of, of, of capacity uh, and, and endemic corruption at a local level that, 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 is, that continues to bedevil um, the, 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 the approach uh, the, at, uh, and efforts at, at, at stabilization there. So, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, that, that the, the, the challenges remain very grave. I, one, one, one thing that, that we've got to look at very carefully over the next couple of months or that you know, it's this time of year when, um, as the the, the uh, mountain uh, the snows in the mountain passes melt, that um, uh, Taliban fighters cross over from the mountainous frontier provinces in um, in Pakistan into Afghanistan. Uh, but with the intensity of fighting that's uh, occurring in the Swat Valley, for instance, um, uh, I, I'm just sort of curious the extent to which some of those fighters that might have otherwise chosen to go and fight. Uh, and attack U.S. forces uh, in Afghanistan this summer might, uh, might otherwise be sort of diverting to uh, uh, parts of Pakistan where there are ongoing operations with the Pakistani military. And so that remains one thing to, to continue to watch. And, you know, this was President Zardari's complaint to President Obama the other day that we're focusing so much effort and forces into Afghanistan that is pushing more into Pakistan. Well, remember, that was the mistake in, in 2001, that, they, that, that as we moved forces into the east, that it pushed it in into, into the Fata. And conversely, there's some concern but by, by sending more U.S. troops into the south, we'll now push it into Baluchistan and create instability in, in yet another part of Afghanistan. And so I think that's something to watch. You know, something I would add to Rajiv's point um, is we have a couple of things coming up. We have elections coming up in August. And, we ha and the, remember, U.S. forces in the south are going to places in some areas where no forces have been before and going right into the economic base of the Taliban, the poppy production. Um, and that's not just an economic base for the Taliban, but for the government and for the warlords themselves. So how do you, how do you go about attacking that? Um, and so it's a, upwards of a $4 billion industry, depending on some estimates, half of that going to the government and, and, and the warlords. And so you're going to have U.S. troops who are used to sort of tackling um, security-based issues now dealing with economic issues too, becoming a sort of drug cops. And so how do, you, how do you strike that balance? What kind of pressure do you put on the forces? And how much influence can they really have on the area? Rajiv talked beautifully about the influence of the Taliban on the region. In a lot of cases, the Taliban's able to pay higher salaries than the Afghans are to their police and army. So how do you get over that problem and at the same time try to reshape the economic base of, of the Afghan economy? And this money that they, this is all coming from the poppy production, from narcotics. That's right. That's right. I mean, 90% of the world's 
um, poppy production, heroin production, comes from Helmand Province, where U.S. troops are now headed into, and a lot of places where there have been no troops before. So we'll anticipate heavy fighting. Um, but how do you go about tackling that? People say wheat production as an alternative. The problem is um, twofold. Number one, poppy, you plant it and it's done. It's sort of minimal work, whereas wheat production requires more work. And secondly, and more immediate, if, you, if the Taliban are able to intimidate farmers into growing or providing poppy to them, then it makes it impossible to say to a farmer, provide wheat, when he'll say, why should I do that? My, you're putting my life in jeopardy. You can't, you can't protect me from the Taliban. So it comes back to that fundamental question, how with only 60,000 troops in a country quite much bigger than, than Iraq, do you offer security to people? Do you do, you do the outposts as we did in Iraq and, and, and do patrols, or do you figure out a way to work within a very complex local security system. We want to, uh, I want to go actually go to questions from the audience earlier than we normally do, uh, mainly because we have so many knowledgeable people and experts sitting out here and we'd, we'd love to hear uh, uh, some of your questions. But before we do that, let me just ask all of you, and the, the whole the answers to the short version on this, is the policy that seems to be unfolding now that much different from the Bush administration? A policy, or is it about the same, or is it uh, has it radically changed? You know, it seems more similar to me uh, than not. I mean, they spend a lot of they spend a lot of time with uh, the Pakistanis in recent times, trying to convince them to focus on the insurgency rather than India. General Hayden's in the audience here. General Hayden spent a good deal of this last year in office trying to convince the Pakistanis to do that. It strikes me that many of the orders that President Bush issued last summer have, if anything, been accelerated by President, uh, by President Obama. Really? And I think just following up on what David said, what we're, st what we're seeing, a, a, particularly with regard to Afghanistan, is, is additional money being put against the problem, or at least the promise of additional money being put against it. But so it, it, what's going on here is it's, it's largely sort of following through and funding some of the, uh, the, 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 the initiatives uh, to a broad degree that the Bush administration had talked about but just didn't have the resources to, uh, to, to, to actually fund because uh, one reason was because of Iraq. Uh, the other was, in some cases, just a you know a, a lack of follow through. Mm -hmm. But I think what, what we're starting to see is 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 moving forward in a in a more meaningful way um, in, in that direction. Uh, one change, however, is um, the the relationship that seems to be developing between the Obama White House and President Karzai. Um, Karzai enjoyed a, a very very close relationship with the Bush White House. Uh, there were. Uh, you know, regular video teleconferences uh, between uh, Bush and, and Karzai. Um, there, there was a, a sort of a close personal friendship that had developed between the two men starting in about 2002. Um, the Obama administration is instituting a, a much more of an arm's length relationship with him. Those video teleconferences aren't occurring. Um, the, uh, the, meeting that, uh, the meetings that Karzai had when he was here with President Zardari a couple of weeks ago, while very polite, did not have the same degree of, you know, bonhomie that, that those interactions did uh, during the Bush administration. Yeah, I would just add, add to that. I think the ultimate change, and it happened really before the policy was announced, was that the Obama um, administration came in and called this the good war, the justified war, the war that had to be fought. So perhaps the biggest change is the emphasis and how much the administration has already sort of staked its foreign policy legacy on the outcome of this war. Edward? I haven't got much to add to that, but I would say there's one positive factor in the sea of bad news recently has been the Indian election result um, in the last 10 days, the return of the Congress government, but um, with a much stronger mandate. And I think, you know, if you'd looked at the possible political consequences of the Mumbai terror attacks last November, you would have predicted uh, a Hindu nationalist um, uh, as a beneficiary, the BJP as a beneficiary from this, which would have been very, very bad for Pakistan paranoia. Um, so I think this is a plus factor, and I think in his wildest dreams, if Holbrook could think of one thing that would help cut through the various Gordian knots that he's trying to, to grapple with in the region, it would be dramatic progress on Kashmir um, to, to really take the sting out of the Pakistan um, posture towards in India. And that's, while still unlikely, um, quite a bit less unlikely today than it would have been two weeks ago. The, is the general feeling in Pakistan is that India still poses a greater threat to Pakistan mm -hmm. than 
than any of this internal. And why is that? Um, Are uh, they right? Uh, you know, I mean, I think Parky, that's a very complex question that, that I could bore you to death with over the next hour. But I mean, the, the, you know, the one pa Pakistan in many ways is defined as being not India. You know, it's it's a homeland for India's Muslims, um, and the the raison d'etre of the Pakistan army has been to reclaim Kashmir. That's why it's got such a preponderance over the Pakistan budget, and why it's the only really serious national functioning institution in the country. So. For the, for the Pakistan military, um, the Kashmir problem, you know, is, is, is both a cause of enmity but also a cause for celebration. It is why it is as powerful and as wealthy and as lavishly funded as it is. Um, so um, if you wanted a deal on Kashmir, I guess you'd need, you'd, need a, you'd need a military government on the other side, or at least if you wanted a deal that stuck, you'd need the military to sign off on it. You'd need General Kiani to be really in, intimately involved in such a deal. But as I say, I don't think the deal is, is quite, quite so impossible as some people may, may imagine. And the last point I'd make on that is Steve Cole's piece in The New Yorker a few weeks back about the off-the-shelf deal on Kashmir when Musharraf was still in power. Um, that, that deal's still there. Like the Arab-Israeli problem, we know, we know what the end result's going to look like. Um, it's a question of how we get there. But, but the Indians, um, and, as I, I'm sure you'd agree, um, bristle at the notion that like, the Kashmir issue be linked to the AFPAC issue. And they, they made it very clear that they don't want uh, Kashmir to be part of Holbrook's mandate, and, and, and officially it isn't, although people in the State Department clearly recognize that the Kashmir issue does have a, a very, very significant and central impact on, on Pakistan and by then by extension Afghanistan. Of course, the Pakistanis uh, would, would, uh, would love the United States to get involved and, and to play uh, uh, a role there. So there remains that fundamental point of disagreement between, between the two nations. And in, India was part of his original, I mean, it was a mistake, his original designation. And, and just as a brief aside, David Miliband, the British Foreign Secretary, went there and just before inauguration for a trip to India, mentioned Kashmir, as British Foreign Secretaries always do infelicitously, um, and got, <laughs> got completely hounded to death by the Indian media. And a couple of days later, Holbrook dropped India from his designation. There's a, there's a saying, not from India, I think it's from China, that you, you kill the chicken to scare the monkey. Um, and in this case, poor old Miliband was the chicken. <laughs> All right, well, let's take some questions from the audience. And we do have General Hayden here with us today. General, would you take a question or would you like to make a comment? All right. My name is Kami Bhatt. I write for the Pakistani Spectator. Uh, David, I asked you a question on Don Rim show, but I didn't get an answer. Do you know where are American uh, nuclear uh, bombs, and why should we expect that we give peanut to Pakistan and then ask them where are your uh, atomic nuclear weapons? It's very, very unfair. I mean, Pakistan is not our slave state. We shouldn't expect these kind of things. If you read Ambassador Haqqani's book, you will learn that Pakistani army is very incompetent. All they know how to conquer Pakistan and how to exploit their own people. What do you expect? How can they defend their own country with uh, traditional weapons because they don't have money? Pakistan is a practically bankrupt country. After they pay their armed forces or their federal employees, they have nothing left. So the only option they have make small strategic uh, nuclear weapons to defend their country. Thanks. All right. Who'd like to take that? Well, <laughs> thanks. Next time, do I, do I get a hard one, Bob? <laughs> um, you know, what I think is interesting about what's not in the discussion right now is you haven't heard anybody, including the Obama administration or the Bush administration before it, suggest that they were going to reverse the fact that Pakistan is a nuclear state. You did hear that in 1998 after the, after the Indian and Pakistan passed and we had <coughs> sanctions on both countries and the ostensible part of that sanction regime was that Pakistan would give up its nuclear weapons. Of course, it's not a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as you know, India is not and Israel is not and, and North Korea has, uh, has pulled out of the treaty. Um, you don't hear that discussion anymore. So there is basically acknowledgement at this point that Pakistan is a nuclear state irreversibly. And 
that is why there is so much discussion right now about nuclear safety. Because I think we're well past that moment when any American president thinks that they're going to get them to give it up. Did you have a question? Yes. I'm Patrick Cronin from the National Defense University. Great panel, excellent discussion. Um, could ask many questions. Let me just make one very brief comment, picking up on Edward Luce's point, which I think is critical, because there are things that Washington can change about South Asia and Southwest Asia, and there are things we cannot change. One thing we can change is the way we do development, using local people, buying locally, empowering local people, and we're not going to do that. And I hope you report that from the field as we fail to ad adapt quickly enough to this reality. Now, the question, though, is things we can't change, especially the political leaders we're dealing with both in Afghanistan with the upcoming August election and in Pakistan with Zadari. To what extent is U.S. strategy, if it can be called that, uh, predicated on the success and the willingness, political willingness, of those leaders to go along? For instance, if Karzai gets reelected in August and he starts to sell his cabinet <coughs> positions to unsavory people. Does that sell our strategy down in the next two years? And also in Pakistan, if Zadari really loses more political legitimacy and traction, are we really back to supporting just a military government? Would like to take I'll that. take the aft side of that. Okay. I'd like to as well. uh, uh, I think what we're seeing is a, are steps toward, you know, really delinking the, the, the broader U.S objectives in Afghanistan from, uh, from Karzai and from um, an expectation that Karzai will follow through for a variety of reasons. One, because of just general concerns about the ineffectiveness of his administration, his, um, uh, his sometimes sort of mercurial tendencies, uh, his uh, um, uh, tendency to, to sort of bring in unsavory uh, actors into his orbit. Uh, most recently seen by his decision to bring, you know, the former warlord Marshal Fahim in as one of his vice presidential running mates. Um, and so the, 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 um, the governance focus, uh, at least as it's being articulated now, and it's going to, we'll have to wait and see how this actually plays out, is to a degree some of what we've been trying to do uh, in Iraq, which is a, a far more sort of local decentralized strategy, working more with, with local governors, local councils, pushing down into sort of a district level, um, trying to build up those sorts of institutions, partially uh, as a counterweight to Karzai, and partially because the recognition that Afghanistan is a, is a diverse country, the central government historically has not always been able to project its authority in the far corners of the country, and that we have to make the, 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 the parts of government that most people sort of uh, relate to, which is the real local government, or they, they interact with, um, more effective as opposed to sort of um, uh, devoting the bulk of our, our energies and resources to the administration in Kabul. You know, I would just add to that. When you talk to the residents in Kabul, they really resent the United States sort of foisting and upholding this, the mayor of Kabul, Hamid Karzai, and it's really cost the United States, and I think there's a recognition of that. We were talking earlier about what are the biggest differences, and I think one of them is under the Bush administration, it was very sort of top-down in terms of governance, and as Rajiv mentioned, and now it's sort of a combination, it's top down plus bottom up and, and in recognition of that. The danger becomes, you know, we, we go to Iraq as a, the model and we say, we reached out to tribal leaders, Iraq's a lot more linear than Afghanistan. You know, if you're in Anbar, you deal with the Dulamis, and in Samara, you deal with five or six tribal leaders. Whereas Afghanistan is a complex matrix of tribal relationships, and I think the danger becomes we end up picking one person and all of a sudden find ourselves intermixed in a tribal war that we didn't intend to be a part of. And I think that'll be the biggest danger coming forward. But um, there's certainly a recognition of that, that problem, and, and I think you're starting to see this dual approach that wasn't there before. And with regard right. to Pakistan, while you know in the past the relationship was largely focused on Musharraf, um, this administration <coughs> seems to, while you know keeping... Uh, uh, you know, cordial relations to a degree with, with Zardari, uh, ensuring that there are, um, you know, uh, extensive, um, you know, links with, with, you know, General Kiani, the military, with the ISI, and, and essentially trying to, to, to deal with um, all of the, the locuses of power in, in Pakistan as opposed to, to simply a, uh, a sort of uh, head of state to head of state relationship. Yes, sir. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. for uh, excellent panel here. My name is Mehtab Karim, and I'm an academic professor of demography, and I'm currently doing a book on demography of Muslim countries at Pew Research Center. I have uh, uh, some reaction to a billion-dollar remark uh, made by Mr. Lewis. It was not a billion, it was a 200 million, actually, because I was a student those days, and I remember it very well. Anyways, I think you're, and then what you said, I really agree with all, all the points. It's very important, where are we investing in Pakistan and Afghanistan? Being a demographer, I have to tell you some numbers, unfortunately. 175 million people, 33% of them are youth between the ages of 15 to 29 in Pakistan. Uh, about half of them are men, about 30 million. 30% 30 of them are unemployed, okay? That makes 9 million. The 30 million youth is more than the population of Afghanistan and Iraq. You have to look into these issues. Now, where are we investing? Where are, what are we doing? I do I agree with the gentleman here? Military. Well, uh, being an academic, I do agree with him. What do we do with these people? You know, they are multiplying. The number is increasing. We have to invest where we can take care of them. Nine million unemployed people I'm talking about. Invest in agriculture, productivity, industries. You see, one of the major investment U.S. is doing is bringing those young people to U.S. to, to do graduate studies, about 200 in a year. They come from elite classes. They don't go work and work back in Pakistan, many of them like many of us are sitting here <coughs> from foreign countries, they, they sp uh, we stay here. I came a long time back to study, fortunately on my own, because my parents couldn't afford, afford it, but I stayed back. So what, what we are looking for is investing somewhere so that we can take care of the, the people. And these young men, somebody said it, that if you don't help them, they go to Taliban. And they can go and become hard guns for $100,000. They can buy 100 of them. So that's what is my submission. Thank you very much. You want to say that? I, I think you're making a key point there with regard to um, uh, unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, Pakistan. And, and also it is a, a significant issue in Afghanistan uh, and a, a significant sort of uh, uh, a source of recruitment for the Taliban, and, and you, you, you pointed to agriculture, and, 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 and that, that's an important thing to mention here because agriculture is really vaulted to the top of the list uh, for, for Holbrook and, uh, and, and the U.S. Uh, government's uh, uh, approach uh, in terms of reconstruction uh, and uh, economic assistance in, in AFPAC. Um, uh, and, and for a variety of reasons, job creation as well as on the Afghan side, uh, counter narcotics. Um, and if you look at the history of the U.S. Uh, aid program in Afghanistan with regard to, to agriculture, it's just heartbreaking. Um, uh, so much potential there, and um, the, the program, and I've spent a fair bit of time over the past couple of weeks looking at, at, at some of these issues. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we have not... Uh, uh, emphasized helping uh, farmers to to increase their their yields, their productivity. It's been uh, very much focused on on trying to grab headlines here and there with sort of export promotion and you know well, we're flying a group a plane of pomegranates out to Dubai. But but the the real hard work of, of trying to work with farmers across the country in Afghanistan, trying to 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 use Pakistani uh, counterparts uh, in in parts of Pakistan to help. Uh, ex expand agricultural opportunity there, and by extension, uh, economic opportunity. Uh, just that sort of work hasn't been done, um, and, and so what, what we're what, what this administration is, 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 is stated they, they plan to do is, is sort of like a, a multi-hundred million dollar uh, effort over over the next few years at, at trying to, to, to really uh, boost uh, agricultural production. Uh, and, and there's a, a, an awful lot of uh, uh, of need for it. I mean, when you, get, when you look at sort of the poppy side of things, um, you know, the Taliban have been incredibly savvy. Afghans aren't planting poppy just because a Taliban warlord comes and puts a gun to their head. Uh, and they're not planting it simply because poppy fetches more money than other crops at, at the market. They're doing it because it's an entire agricultural system. 
a lot of these guys are dirt poor subsistence farmers and they can get credit up front if they plant poppy. There's they're, they're Taliban kind of agricultural extension agents that show up and help them increase the yields of their poppy. They're futures contracts so that they know what they're going to get for their poppy at harvest time. There's farm gate delivery. These guys come and pick up that stuff. What do we do? We do occasional sort of fertilizer and seed giveaways, but we're not engaged in agricultural credit. We're not we haven't meaningfully engaged our land grant universities here to help uh, to help provide agriculture extension services. The Defense Department has admirably done some of this through the National Guard program, but not in a, not in a much larger way. So there, there, there are huge areas in which our our broader reconstruction effort has just completely fallen down on the job. Uh, All right. Can I just add yes. a couple of things? As long as we're in the business of numbers correction, I have to make a correction on my number. It's 400 million, not 4 billion. I'll break it down for you. The estimate 150 million goes to the uh, Taliban, 70 million to the farmers, and the rest to um, the warlords and uh, the uh, government. And then the economy, that's 500. I mean, it's just it's an incredibly weak economy. And I would just add anecdotally when I was in Helmand Province in southern Farah, uh, in southern Afghanistan, one of the first places the Marines moved into, you would see bags and bags and bags of wheat lined up along the street that Americans had shipped in. And you asked the Marines, what are we doing with this? And they, they just didn't know. It sort of arrived, and they, they didn't really have a plan on how to get this out, how to distribute it. All right. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Stefan Strode from N24, a German uh, news channel. Mm -hmm. I would like to come back to the military part for a moment. Uh, Secretary Gates, in a recent 60 Minutes interview, complained bitterly about the lack of support from the European allies. Uh, the German government tells us every once in a while that once they explain to the Americans how much they are doing already in Afghanistan, they do understand that the Germans, <coughs> yes, they are active. And what remains unmentioned is probably the fact that the Germans are leaning back, having started two world wars. It's not too... Um, too popular to be too active in a ongoing war. What is, this, what is the view on the ground? Are the Germans being viewed as basically, you know, watching the food lines and leaving the fights uh, to everybody else? Well, candidly, I think from the, for the Germans, because they're in RC North, the northern part of Afghanistan, which doesn't border Pakistan, has seen some of the least amount of um, <coughs> violence, that they have sort of the easiest assignment. And you're right, there are 41 coalition countries that are participating. Um, from the American perspective, there's a frustration, and it's not so much just the numbers, but how they operate. And I th it's, it's sort of um, an approach. You know, I think the U.S. I mean, you'll hear um, ISAF, which is the the acronym that they use. That um, you know, the Americans will say that it really stands for I saw Americans fighting instead of international security. You know, <laughs> so that's sort of um, that's the one you'll hear. I mean, I don't think it's so much the numbers, which although for Secretary Gates it is. But I think for the guys on the ground, it's what they see. They see, um, broadly speaking, not the Germans, but broadly speaking, coalition forces that don't go out as much, that don't take as much risk. Now, I think from the European side, they see the Americans as reckless, as shooting too quickly, as tearing down doors too quickly. And I think that's the sort of on the ground fiction, um, as much as it is for the Secretary's numbers. But I think for the guys on the ground, it's that friction. All right, let me, uh, let me just say, uh, I think we have time for just one more question here. So. Hello, Greg Tomlin from George Washington University. Thank all of you for taking the time to actually visit the country before you report. Uh, my question is, as you know, <laughs> two, <laughs> two weeks ago, Secretary Gates asked for General McKiernan's re resignation. Do you, in your opinion, think that this was largely symbolic, or do you foresee a significant change in theater strategy? Thank you. All right, just short answers, and everybody can take a chance. All right, it has you know, some, so. we're waiting to see. I mean, the. Uh, the public line that Secretary Gates took was that uh, McKiernan had done a perfectly solid job, but he wanted a new set of eyes. And of course, the man he has chosen ran special forces for many years, and one would assume would come to it with a strategy that is more based that way. But we haven't seen it yet, and of course, uh, strategies that are based on special force operations are often the hardest ones to, to see the results of. Special Forces operations in Afghanistan have been um, uh, blamed for uh, a high number of civilian casualties, which have, which have had a, you know, a significant effect uh, uh, on, on public support for, for international forces in Afghanistan. Um, I'm not suggesting that General McChrystal will seek to implement a, a, you know, a theater-wide Special Forces approach, but 
um, what, what the, the overall stated strategy here is, is a counterinsurgency strategy. And so there's going to be, a, I think, a challenge as he sort of takes uh, his special forces background and, and seeks to sort of uh, uh, migrate that into sort of a theater-wide counterinsurgency strategy. I should also note that I, I did find it a little unusual that, um, that General McKiernan was essentially being uh, uh, you know, drummed out of the military when um, other generals whose performance has been questioned by their superiors, most notably General Casey and General Sanchez in Iraq, were both you know, brought back here. And uh, in the case of General Casey, he was made vice chief, chief of staff of the Army. In the case of General Sanchez, I think, was, was sort of kept around as a general officer for at least a year before he retired. That's right. I mean, he is the first general to be fired since MacArthur, so it is breathtaking. I think the only thing though, going forward is the local press will talk that given General McChrystal's background, they think that though this will be a more kinetic commander, that they'll see more fighting on the ground based on his background. So he comes in with that sort of um, bias from, from, from the locals. Uh, Obama has a new strategy and he needs his own general. I, but in following the spirit of the question, uh, I don't cover the Pentagon, so I've got nothing to add to what the other three have said, which... We're going to just close here. Uh, give us a 30-second, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, I, think, I, think we're in for a, I think we're in for a tough year. I mean, things may well turn around, but you know, when you put that many more American forces into Afghanistan, you are, uh, of course, um, going to see more fighting, and we're going to take more casualties. And, uh, Secretary Gates has said if we can't turn it around in a year, he thinks the American public might might uh, uh, lose some of its, uh, its willingness to take those casualties. I think the thing to watch is Pakistan. It is the home game for al-Qaeda. It is the home game in many ways for elements of the Taliban. And uh, I think that they may well conclude that with 60,000 Americans in Afghanistan, they're much wiser to focus their energies there. Two things that I'm going to try to watch this year. On the Pakistani side, will the Pakistani military be able to engage in counterinsurgency operations? Uh, what they need to do in the Swat Valley, uh, they're still in the sort of the clear phase. Can they hold? Can they build? Can they actually uh, implement uh, 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 a, a meaningful counterinsurgency strategy? That's what they have to do. Um, and will the United States be able to provide the necessary support they need to mount those sorts of coin operations? On the Afghan side, one thing that I think we should all be, be looking out for is the degree to which uh, an experiment in Wardak province called AP3, or the Afghan Public Protection Force, which is an effort to work with local tribal leaders to raise sort of <coughs> local security forces. I, you know, uh, the, the military doesn't like them being called militias, but to, to a degree, that's what they are. They're local militia units. Uh, will that be effective? Will that be a model that can be replicated in other parts of the country? And will that uh, enable uh, the Afghan government and, by extension, the coalition to more quickly uh, get uh, additional sort of boots on the ground to provide local security? Because uh, training the Afghan National Army is a, is a long and complicated process. And uh, if we're looking for results over the next 12 to 24 months, which is what officials at the White House have said, is, uh, is their time frame that they feel like they need to start demonstrating results to the American people clearly before the 2010 midterms, um, that um, we've got to look at, at whether uh, that uh, effort is uh, starting to bear any fruit. I'll bring the sort of narrow Pentagon correspondent perspective to it. I, I'm looking for the effect, the Iraq-Afghanistan balance. My biggest fear going forward is not that we've seen sort of violence escalating in Iraq. My biggest fear isn't that things get out of control or go bad in Iraq quickly, but that they go bad slowly. And that as we're slowly bringing down troops and escalating them in, in Afghanistan, we, that we potentially find ourselves mired in, in, in two conflicts and that balance. So for me as a Pentagon correspondent, I'm watching that, how we balance those two, particularly as the violence has gone up in Iraq. Edward. Um, I'd simply say in that part of the world that things are never as good or as bad as they seem, and right now they seem bad. But um, in Pakistan, there's been a lot of fear mongering that it, it's going to have an Iran-style re revolution or there's going to be a, a, um, a breaking in the chain of command coup um, that'll, that'll bring bearded colonels to power or indeed the disintegration of the state. Um, I, I think it's worth remembering that in the recent elections, the support for, for the MMA, the grouping of six, Pakistani Islamist parties fell from 12% in the previous elections to 5% of the total vote. 
Um, and it's also worth remembering that the really serious political mass movements in Pakistan of the last two years have been led by middle class lawyers, um, secular movements, um, and that the proliferation of free media in the country uh, in the last few years, which started under Musharraf, um, was permitted under Musharraf, has, has really continued. So don't underestimate the strength of civil society out there. You can look at, or not strength, but the, the, don't overlook the fact that there is a civil society out there. And I think we tend to overlook that. And I, and I think things aren't necessarily as bad as they seem. They're bad, but they're not, they're not catastrophically bad. All right. Well, thank you all on behalf of the TCU School of Journalism and CSIS. And thanks for the time. Thank you. Everybody.